psychological curse on humanity today is fatherlessness in every country fatherlessness and what does that mean 99% of the men in this room perhaps have never been told by their father face to face as a man that I love you maybe 96% of the men in this room never heard their father say to them you make me proud you done well not because your father is in the house doesn't mean he's fathering you another concern that I've concluded is this one statement dad is destiny write it down I got this statement from a cover story from Newsweek magazine they were doing a main article in Newsweek magazine during the period of father father's day and they did a research on fathers and this statement was made by that secular magazine based on all of their research they concluded that dad is destiny and what they meant was so go the men so go the nation I don't have time to give you all the stats that they talk about but it's in that book on the table called the principle of fatherhood please read that book very important stats that they came up with but they found out that 92 percent of all problems in society is related to the absence of a male in the family whether it's boys with guns or girls with babies dropouts of school prisons filled with young men all related they say to the absence of a father in the house the secular world therefore agrees with God finally if you read what God's conclusion of humanity's problem is it may shock you but in the last chapter of Malachi the last three verses God concludes what man needs he talks about the coming of the Messiah he talks about John the Baptist being a forerunner to the coming of Christ and then he says what would be the focus of the mission of Jesus and what John would preach and emphasize and here's what he says in Malachi he will come and he will return the hearts of the children back not to the mothers but to the fathers and the fathers back to the children otherwise he says I will curse the land wow. which means whenever a society is crumbling and seem like it's under a curse God says it's because the fathers are absent on, not the devil after you read that statement in Malachi you'll find a blank page in your Bible you check there's a blank page that blank page is 400 years of silence God said nothing for 400 years and then suddenly a man appears in the wilderness when you turn the page to Matthew 2 and it's John the Baptist and John the Baptist introduces this great Messiah who came to return the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the children back to the fathers here's what's interesting and mysterious to me Jesus when he came to solve man's problem never chose a woman as a disciple why he came to fix humanity and he had to follow a blueprint and the blueprint didn't call for women he had to deal with the original blueprint to fix humanity so he knew he had to deal with 
what the blueprint called for and it called for the males to be fixed first the Bible says he chose 12 but the women followed there's a very important scenario here men you got to go get men but women they just show up they're ready to shout women just show up let's have church they say but men, they play in sports, they out in the clubs, they drinking liquor, they smoking dope, they in jail. You got to go get them. That's why churches are filled with women. He was dealing with healing humanity. Now let me tell you what's happening to the male. Here's a verse you never saw before, guaranteed. It's found in Psalm 62. It talks about exactly what's happening to the male right now in your country. Psalm 62 talks about how we are treated as males. Here's what it says in verse 3. How long will you assault a man? Hmm. Would all of you throw him down this leaning wall? This tottering fence. That's what they're doing to us. We are already leaning. And they're pushing us. You could never do anything right, they say. You're just like your pa, they say. You could never succeed in anything. You are a loser. You can't even keep your children. You can't take care of your wife. You can't keep a job. They keep pushing. Look at that. How long will you assault a man? Society is assaulting us. David says, they fully intend to topple him from his lofty place. Talking about man now. They take delight in lies. They lie on us. Men. They lie with their mouths and they bless. But in their hearts they curse us. He's talking about what they do to men. Listen to this. He says, but fine rest on my soul. Everybody say rest has arrived. David says, even though they try to destroy me as a male, uh, I find my rest, oh my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. Are you listening to me? He alone is my rock and my salvation, and he is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Men, we are in such dire straits, only God can help us. Stay with me. So here's what I call the male's mind today. Most of you could relate to this list. Men don't feel the power of self-confidence anymore. They don't feel the power of social roles anymore. Men don't feel the power of their masculinity anymore. That's why many of them are not sure whether they are men. Many men don't feel like they're wanted by women anymore. How many women have you met who said to you, I don't need your car, I don't need your money, I don't need your house, I don't need nothing from you, I got everything myself. And some of you married women that are making you feel like dirt because when you met her, she had babies and house already. And then she puts pressure on you by saying, why don't you be a man? Well, you don't know what to be a man, you don't know what that means anymore. Because when your father was a man, it was easy. Remember? Being a man in your father's era was very easy. To be a man meant he had to go to work, bring home the bacon, build a house, provide the groceries, and pay for the kids. That was, a, that was to, to be a man, it was easy. A woman's job was to keep the house, cook the food, and nurse the babies. Everybody was clear. Today, that's finished. To be a man, you don't know what it is to be a man anymore. I mean, to be a man, so do I buy a house? She got a house. Do I buy a car? She got two. 
Do I give her children? She came with three of them already. Do I buy her groceries? She owns the refrigerator. Should I give her money? She bought on the pig, not just the bacon. She's making more than me. So now the guy is stuck. So what am I supposed to do to be a man now in this house? And that's your problem right now. Listen to me carefully. God sent me 2,000 miles to tell you what your problem is. Your problem is you don't feel wanted anymore. How many times have a woman threatened you? If you don't do what I say, you can get out. This is my house. You remember the days when your father was a man? He used to say, this is my house. And I, I wear the pants in this house. She wear pants too now. So what do you mean you wear the pants? It's tough to be a man. Men don't feel needed anymore. Of course she doesn't need you. Her salary is higher than yours. She owns the condominium. The car you're driving is her car. The TV you're watching is her TV. And the food in the refrigerator is her food and the fridge. I can tell you to be a man. That's why a lot of men don't know what to do. They don't feel appreciated. They don't feel respected. And they don't feel secure. That's why many men act like women. They are feminized because they are threatened by the woman. I wish I had two more days to talk to you. Because you see, the problem is the woman don't know what she's doing to you. She needs help too. Because she's destroying your masculinity. Here's the other problem. I call it the male crisis. Write this down. The men have lost their sense of purpose. That's why they bounce from job to job to job. They don't know what their career is. They don't know what their vocation is anymore. They kind of move around, just kind of bounce around. They have no sense of purpose. Number two, they lost their identity. That's why they pretend to be other people. Sometimes men pretend to be women. They have no identity. Thirdly, men lost their definition of manhood. They don't know what it is. They also lost their value to life. They lost their meaning in their lives. They have no reason to live. Most men lost their role. They don't know what it is to be a man in society or in the home. They lost their sense of significance. They feel that they are not important to the world anymore. And the average man, that's why he drinks and is in gangs and he kills and he shoots and he domestically violates his family because he is a man who has no sense of value. He has no vision. He lost his sense of importance. He also lost his sense of authority. How many men are afraid to lift their voice in their own house? The children that live in your house ain't yours. So what do you do with them when they curse you back? They tell you, you're not my daddy. I mean, this is, this is frightening to some men. That's why a lot of you men, I know you're quiet in here. We're going to deal with this stuff. You go home to her children. You've been married for five years and the kids call you by your first name. No authority. And you can't correct them when they curse and do foolishness. You can't even correct them. There's no authority in the house. So you feel like a slave, like a dog. That's what men are dealing with today. And they are in this room. Men lost their sense of respect. No one respects the male anymore, so he doesn't respect himself either. And then men also lost what I call their own manhood. They lost their manhood. This is why they try to define manhood in very difficult ways. Now let me tell you the result of all of this crisis. The result is this, very important list. First of all, the challenge is, the, is that the male is struggling with his purpose. He doesn't know why a male was created. He also is struggling with his manhood. He doesn't know what it is to be a man. And he also doesn't know what it is to have authority. He's trying to regain authority by force or by abuse. Men are also struggling with their self-image. They're not sure how to be a man, so they, they imitate other men who are not worthy of imitation. They're trying to find their image. And then men are also trying to live with a woman in the 21st century. It's almost impossible to live with a woman in the 21st century. 
Because she doesn't need nothing from you. You buy a wife, I mean a woman a gift? She said, that's cheap. I mean, break your heart. You can't buy a car, she got two of them. You can't buy a clothing, she got a closet full when you met her. So men are struggling with how to live with a woman who has everything. It's challenging. And when you meet a woman who has her own house, her own car, refrigerator, food, clothes, and everything else, and you move into the house after you get married, it ain't your house. So there's that fear that stays with you all during them years. You're afraid to conflict with her. You're afraid to challenge her because she might put you out. Am I talking to anybody here? I know you all are quiet because I'm up in your face, but I want to deal with this, you see. Because if we're going to fix the men, we've got to first understand their problem. Now, what's the result of all of this confusion for the male? First of all, the male lost his self-image. We've got to deal with that this week. Secondly, he lost his self-concept. The picture of what a man's supposed to be like. He also lost his self-confidence. That's why most men are very timid, very shy, and very angry. All mixed up in one. They also lost their self-worth. They don't feel valuable anymore. You know what made my father feel valuable? When my mother told him, thank you for bringing home food. Thank you for having a roof over our heads. Thank you for providing for the kids. That made him feel valuable. But you don't hear that no more today. Because the kids on the roof are hers. So you're struggling just to feel important to your wife. We also lost our sense of self-esteem. What makes us feel significant? We begin to hate ourselves. We lost our self-love. And therefore, we lost our conviction. Most men I meet have no conviction in life. They just want to kind of pay a bill and die. There's no sense of assignment, no sense of, of purpose, no sense of, of, of living for a reason. No conviction. That's why they sleep around. No conviction. Her baby's all over the city. No conviction. Now, ladies, uh, brothers, listen to me, brothers, listen to me. This resulted in a condition that we're dealing with. I call it the male condition. Write it down. Confusion. The average man is confused. Why? He's confused about everything. He don't know who he is, why he is, where he is, what he is, and why he's going, where he's going. He don't, he don't understand the women, don't understand what women want, don't understand what society wants from him. So he's confused. And therefore, he's also angry. 90% of the men in this room are angry men. You won't admit that, but I know that's true. And your anger is deeply concealed. I guarantee you that all the men, all the men in prison are angry men. All. And if you, listen, I've done interviews with these men for my books. Everyone was angry. And 90% of them was angry at their father who they never met. Or who they never saw, or who was never there, or who they couldn't talk to. They were angry, and their anger comes out in frustration. And the frustration comes out in self hatred, and the self hatred is manifested in depression. And most men are depressed, and they quietly carry their anger. And they are afraid. And because men are afraid, they go to the gym. And they buy protein products. And they pump iron and they, and they try to look big because they are afraid. It's called concealed fear. And that fear makes them violent. In other words, if I can't be a man because I can't buy you clothing and shoes, I'll slap you to show you I'm a man. Bam! And he slaps the woman. Kicks her. Why? I'm a man, he says. He's angry. Why would a man take a can of paint and go to a newly painted wall 
and deface it. He's angry at society. And that anger is in this room. We got to get rid of that anger. Domestic violence comes from resentment. The reason why men are resentful is because they are so angry, they want to blame everybody else for their anger. So they transfer it. Resentment means you transfer what you are feeling to other people. You blame them for your own behavior. My father was in there. My mother mistreated me. I was abused when I was small. I mean, this resentment, we transfer it. That results in social abandonment. That's when men give up on society. There's no hope. No use me going to school. No use me going trying to get a good job. No use to me trying to advance myself. They just abandon themselves to society and say, I'm not getting involved in the rat race, they say. They give up. And so we get gangs all over the city. We got all kind of social clubs. We got all kind of, of, uh, of uh, fraternities. All these different things we try to... Because we've given up. And the last thing is that men manifest this hatred in domestic abdication. Abdication means he decides to leave the home. I can't take it anymore, I'm out of here. That's why divorce rates are so high. Infidelity is so high. Abandoning kids is so high. Spreading your sperm around the city is so high. Why? You just abandon society. Domestic abandonment. I ain't, lady, I'm out of here. I'm out of here, woman. I'm gone. Because the man is suffering that whole list. Let me tell you something. Even getting saved doesn't solve this problem. I know of preachers who beat their wives. Follow the Holy Ghost. I know preachers who curse at their children. Mad. Curse at their wives. Slap them. And then preach the next morning. Because they never dealt with the, the real issue. Manhood. Why is this important to talk about? Because if we don't deal with this, this is the response we're going to get. I am glad you're here tonight and will be here the next two days because in order for the male to get help, he has to respond correctly. Here's what I am recommending and I'm happy to see you because I think you're responding correctly. One, for the male to have solutions to his problems, he must first recognize he needs help. And that's tough for a male to admit. Secondly, he must accept the need for help. And thirdly, he must admit that he doesn't know some things. You know, man, you know how we are. Don't look at me like that. We think we know everything. You know what can tell me nothing. I ain't going to no seminar. I'm a man. I ain't going to no conference. I know who the man is. You don't know who the man is. You can't even sleep with your own wife. You got to admit you don't know some things. Yes, sir. I read four books a month. That's a tough thing to do. My iPad got all my books. In. And I, the reason why I read so much is because I don't want to be stupid. I got a family, a wife and kids that I have to lead. I have companies that I have to lead. I have one of the largest churches in my country to lead. I got a government. I got 17 countries that look to me for advice. Presidents and prime ministers look to me for advice. I got to keep reading. Yes, sir. Yeah. When was the last time you read a book and finished it? Wow. Wow. Good, good. You know why you don't read? You think you know everything already. That's your problem. Make it plain. You gotta admit that you don't know. And number four, you must seek the help of successful men. We go to the wrong men to get help. Here's a guy who's been divorced five times and you go to him for advice. That's stupid, man. I'm talking about your brother. Yeah, I mean your blood brother. He can't even stay married. Don't listen to him. You're talking to men who never had a business and want a business advice from them. 
seek successful men and then submit to them. And number five, commit yourself to pursue knowledge. Men, I challenge you to decide from this night forward that you're going to turn your home into a library. You have to do this, brother. No one can learn for you. No one. Commit that you're going to change after this night. You're going to become a pursuer of knowledge as a man. And that goes to you pastors too, because many pastors don't even read a book, including the Bible. They only read the Bible for sermons. <laughs> You got to pursue knowledge. And number six, write this down. Invest in your own education. Listen, man, it costs money to buy books and CDs. You, your pastor got a bunch of CDs in that, in that store back there, and you never go there and get a CD from five years ago. Why? You think you know everything. Wow. Man. Invest. One time I was with one of my mentees out in California, and my mentees traveled me some time, and, and he, this one was with me. We went to a... Every time I go to a country or to a city, I go to find a bookstore. Yes, sir. I love books. And I went to the bookstore, and I picked up some books, you know, on leadership and management, all this stuff. It came to $287. And the mentee said to me, oh, my God. I said, what happened? He says, Shoo. <laughs> you spend that much money on books? I said, yep, this, this, is, this, is, this is low. I normally spend three, 400 bucks on books. He said, wow, I've never seen that before. I said, that's why I'm the mentor. You're the mentee. Watch me. <laughs> So, so we got back in the car, we were driving to the restaurant to eat, and he said, he was quiet for a while, and he said, he said, Dr. Munro, I just can't believe what you just did. I said, what? He said, you just paid $287 for books. That's someone's salary. I said, yep. He said, uh, man, boy, that's a, that's a lot of money to spend on, on, on books. I said, listen to me. The value and the cost of ignorance is always higher than knowledge. Yes, yes. yes. The Bible says all you're getting, get understanding. And then it says if it costs you all you have, get understanding. Proverbs 4 verse 7. You got a choice between a book and a box of chicken after this meeting. I'm serious. And some you're going to go right past the book table and go get your KFC and you're going to become more ignorant with a bunch of cholesterol. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> When you eat chicken, it stays in your system for six hours. Yeah. It comes out of the drought, Jesus says. Right. Yes, sir. But you buy a book and read it, it stays forever. Yeah. You got a choice between that 20 bucks for a book or chicken. Come on. Yes, sir. You have to invest in your own development. And number seven, accept your weakness. Men, if you're going to become real men, first you got to be honest with yourself where you are weak. I don't know everything. I got a problem in this area. I got a habit that's killing me. I have a weakness for women. I got a weakness for drugs. I got a weakness for, for liquor. In other words, be honest first. Stop pretending, hallelujah, praise the Lord, you're okay. And then secret pornography is eating you up. Accept your weakness. Because I can't help you unless you first tell me you need it. Come on, man. Come on. Jesus never volunteered a miracle. Never. That's right. You didn't know that, huh? Every miracle he performed was a result of a question. What can I do for you, he says. He met a blind man one time. He said, what can I do for you? I mean, come on. It's supposed to be obvious. No, it ain't obvious because the blind man made his money by his blindness. You got to accept that you need help. And number eight, when you identify your weaknesses, magnify your strengths. Every male in here got some strong things in his life that are very good. And that's what we got to bring out of you this week. You are a good man, believe me. You've done some bad things, but you are a good man. 
And we got to go after the good man inside of you. Do you know why every man in here love comic books? Let me tell you why you love comic books. You love Superman. All of you love Superman, Batman, you know, Green Hornet, all these guys you love them. You know why you love them? How, all these guys you love them. You know why you love them? Because they remind you of you. All of us are two men in this room. <laughs> That's why you love those characters. They are, they are you. Everybody got a Superman and a Clark Kent. And you never want us to see Clark. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We love Batman, but Bruce Banner is a problem. <laughs> You know what's amazing is when your wife discovers Bruce. <laughs> My God. <laughs> look at you, look at you guys going, oh, please, Dr. Monroe, please. <laughs> I discovered something. If you tell your wife about Clark, yeah. she will have a greater respect for Superman. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm. I remember the day when I decided to tell my wife about Bruce Banner. <laughs> I had to think the whole day before I talked to her that night, the whole day. And we were early in our marriage, you know, and I told her, look, let me tell you a part of me that you need to know. And I need you to help me strengthen and get rid of that person. And when I shared it with my wife, she hugged me. She said, Nothing a woman wants more from a man than honesty. That's what she said to me. She said, you just made me love you more. Amen. From that day, my wife has been the solution to my weakness. She protects that area of my life all those years until it's down to zero. She's made me Superman every day. I want to read a verse to you that you probably never saw before also. I call it the call to men. David was a great father. His son was Solomon. David was a great king, a great politician. He's also a musician, a songwriter, very multi-talented guy. David is on his deathbed about to die. I want you to read what David says to his son. It says in the book of 1 Kings chapter 2 verse 1, when the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to his son, Solomon. Now watch a father talk to a, a son. Quote, I am about to go the way of all the earth. He said, so be strong and show yourself a man. Now that's a good statement from a daddy. Come on, give David a hand. That's, that, that's good stuff, right? That's Boy, they're powerful, isn't it? What a good word for a father to say to a son. Son, I'm about to die. Show yourself a man. Show yourself a man. That's in the Bible. And now he's going to tell him how to show himself a man. He says, first of all, observe what the Lord your God requires. Secondly, walk in his ways. Thirdly, Keep his decrees and his commands. Fourthly, he says, keep his laws and requirements that are written in the book. And then he says, so that you may prosper in all you do. And whatever you, wherever you go, son, you're going to be okay if you keep the law I taught you. Boy, it's a good daddy talking. Did your father leave you the word of God like that? Or he just kind of left you? He just left you, didn't he? He left you when you were nine. He left you when you was 14. He left before you was born. 
And no man ever came to you and says, now show yourself a man. Because most men don't know what a man is. Good God. Good God, That's why I'm here. I'm here to show you how to be a man.